All right, so the recording is now on and I'm going to begin my introduction. My name is Lee Greenwood. I work for the Nature Conservancy as the Don't Move Firewood Campaign Manager in the Forest Health Protection Program of the Nature Conservancy. Now, a lot of you might be familiar with the Nature Conservancy because of our much more prominent efforts in land protection. Um, the Nature Conservancy also does some other efforts that uh, cross the, all of North America as well as internationally, um, including the forest health protection work that we do that goes across a lot of different boundaries in Canada, the United States, and also, Can and also Mexico. Don't Move Firewood is one of those wide ranging programs. So that's the difference. We have a bunch of different types of programs and um, I work for the North America region. Um, I pre prepared this presentation at the request of Sarah Goodwin, um, who I wanted to thank. She encouraged me to tailor something to the Council of Western State Foresters and their leadership coalition to make sure that everybody got the information they wanted about our program. And I'm really pleased to be sharing um, this with you um, because I think it's a very important and um, sort of increasing issue for Western states. So you're looking at my title slide and that shows an extremely Western scene of a billboard that we placed in partnership with the Montana um, Department of Natural Resources that is not too far from Yellowstone actually and that was placed oops sorry um, and that was placed in 2015 um, so that's Northwestern Energy on the right and a don't move fire with billboard on the left all right so first we're start out with a really brief history of the program that's called don't move fire with so it was conceived up by a multi-agency and multi-industry collaborative called the Continental Dialogue on Non-Native Forest Insects and Diseases in the year 2016 and, and sort of also into 2000, uh, 2006 and into 2007. Um, the program was actually launched in the summer of 2008. And um, just so everybody knows, our funding sources have varied throughout time. Um, we started partially funded by the U.S. Forest Service Northeastern Area, as well as private donations. Right now, our primary funding comes from the USDA APHIS Farm Bill 10007 process. So that changes according to what's available, what's applicable, um, and we anticipate, you know, moving forward that it will continue to change. It's a dynamic source of funding. So it's all on, quote, soft money, if you're familiar with that term. Um, it has consistently been managed by Nature Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, that's TNC, um, employees since the start. I have been the campaign manager since my hire in late 2007, and we've also had lots of other people work on the projects through that time. So the number one goal of the Don't Move Firewood campaign has always been consistent. We're making firewood outreach tools that are consistent and accessible to everyone within the entire firewood outreach uh, sphere, you know, the, the phytosanitary world. Um, and Sarah, I think you're not on mute if you wanted to mute yourself, just a tiny bit of background. Okay, so uh, the, the number one place that we disseminate information is through our website. We recently redid it to make it even better than it was before. And some of the major, most useful sections of our website that you might want to refer to after this presentation is complete are um, our firewood state summaries on our North America map. So every single state has a summarized plain English paragraph of what their firewood rules, recommendations, and regulations are, as well as a list of pertinent links. Then we also do guest blogs on success stories of outreach professionals and events. Um, our most recent guest blog I published out yesterday was for the state of uh, Utah. And um, we try to go through all different states. So I also have recent ones from Vermont and actually Hawaii and everywhere. If you ever want to publish a guest blog, let me know. Um, oh, I see, I forgot to mute all the attendees. Just one second, let me do that. Um, we are getting a tiny bit of feedback. Okay, so I think everybody should be muted now and that'll cut down on me. Okay, I hope I got that right. Now, another uh, feature that we have is our resource library where we show all of our different custom materials as well as our genetic materials ranging from posters to brochures to 
billboards, you name it. We also publish what I call a Dear Don't Move Firewood Advice column, which is selected questions for the public, scrubbed of any personal information, and then posted onto the blog to kind of just give a more personal feel and keep people engaged and um, continue putting new information on the website, which helps with search engine rankings. If we never change the website, Google will eventually ignore us, which we would never want. So we publish periodic columns for that purpose as well. And our new renovated website is much more mobile and tablet friendly. So that's a huge advantage. Um, all of our top features, uh, I think it's our six or seven most commonly used pages are available in Spanish on our Spanish version, which is No Mueva La Leña. We also provide most of our um, basic outreach materials in Spanish upon request. Um, we have, oops, sorry, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Um, we have translated versions of a lot of our stuff. Um, and I read Spanish, even though I'm not particularly good at speaking it uh, because I'm too rusty at it. Uh, so I am able to kind of review materials if you ever want to submit something to us in Spanish. Uh, and we advertise our website quite extensively on Google AdWords through a Google AdWords grant. Um, we advertise over $10,000 of in-kind grant dollars every um, month that we're successful, so it's a significant advertising budget that is actually just in-kind donations from Google. Another feature that we have as part of the campaign is our social media presence. We mostly maintain our Facebook account at this point. It's been um, present since 2008. We get a lot of private um, inquiries from the public through our Facebook Messenger. And we provide everybody who is a friend of our Facebook account who is a professional in the outreach realm with a lot of really good fodder. So not only do we um, cross post lots of good stuff, for instance, this example post is from the Hungry Pest campaign that I put up there. Um, so we cross post from related material like Hungry Pest or Emerald Ashbor.info or just USDA or Forest Service or anybody, but we also create our own fresh content a couple times a week. Um, we have over 5,000 active followers and most posts reach a pretty good um, percentage of those between 500 and 3,000 is pretty typical for us on a, a typical post. Sometimes obviously we have a terrible posts and sometimes things go viral and reach a heck of a lot. But that's a good average. We've recently made our Twitter account mostly go dormant. I haven't been really tending to it. Um, industry research is showing that use of Twitter is declining pretty dramatically um, with a few notable exceptions, including um, our president. Uh, but mostly Twitter is going down in terms of usership. And so we have decided to not put a lot of effort into it because it's no longer a really productive place for us to do outreach. However, um, we're going to assess whether or not that is a good or bad decision in about six months after we've um, basically not done much on Twitter to see what we think, get some viewer feedback and um, decide whether or not we should pick it back up or leave it where it is. And that is a common thing that we do within our campaign. We're always trying to practice adaptive management. We look at all of our metrics, we quantify as much as we can, and then we make choices according to how things have gone. So that's a great example of how we're going to manage our Twitter account. We're, make, we're doing an experiment, we'll see how it goes. We'll tell you all how it went. We also have a really large wealth of materials available for professional, professional knowledge building. So certain parts of our website are designed much more for professionals who work in firewood-based outreach than they are actually for the public. For instance, our guest blog, I don't really know why a member of the public would be very fascinated by our guest blogs of um, outreach success stories, but they are outstanding resources for fellow professionals in different states. So for instance, on the bottom right, you see this orange box that says recent posts. That's a screenshot of part of our webinar, our blog, <laughs> excuse me, our website. And um, that guest blog by Corey Yanger in Hawaii talks about how they've been adapting some materials and concepts for the Don't Move Firewood campaign and taking them and representing them to prevent the spread of rapid Ohia death. They also have their own campaign that's freestanding, but we've been working with them to kind of encourage similar wording um, and productive use of our materials in their situation. Because obviously it's very different in Hawaii, but we can learn from each other. So, you know, when you're done, if you wanted to read about what they're doing in Hawaii uh, from a professional standpoint, you could go to our website. 
We also have invasive species profiles that are very useful. Our most recent and newest one is the velvet longhorn beetle, which is an emerging pest of interest. Whether or not it's going to prove to be very damaging is a whole nother question, but it's been pre found present in multiple states. It's breeding in the state of um, Utah, unfortunately, and probably also in another state, and I don't remember which one it is, and I hate to say the wrong one, I believe it might have been Illinois, but you'll have to look at the invasive species profile to learn more about that. Uh, another professional knowledge source that you all might consider becoming tapped into would be our Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative. There's two wings of that effort, one of which is our newsletter. Um, that's that sort of uh, earthy yellow box. If you go to our website and click on that after this presentation is completed, you can sign up or if you already are signed up, thank you very much for being one of the members of our newsletter group. We also do four webinars annually. Um, this is our second one of 2017. Um, and uh, this is essentially a Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative webinar, where we just try to figure out what people need, what they're interested in, what their questions might be. Might be. And then we also present um, more niche topics sometimes according to demand. So for instance, we once did a webinar on the different types of heat treatment standards in different states. And that was very well attended. Different state agency people wanted to learn about other states' heat treatments. So, you know, that kind of thing is um, what we do to increase professional knowledge as a community of practice in firewood outreach. We also do some outreach anchoring. We're trying to make everything easier for communications specialists and outreach specialists. And so we promote relevant events, weeks, awareness weeks, and awareness or topic months. Um, there's a small calendar listing on the page listed there. Don't move firewood, firewood, uh, sorry, firewood outreach year. Um, our signature event, which we started in 2016, is the Firewood Awareness Month event, uh, which is in October, and that has um, was quite successful last year. We also learned a lot, and so we'll be improving it for next year. Um, some of our more recent, uh, some of our major events that we participate in have their own independent resource pages. So, for instance, Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week is coming up in late May, and you could look up our resource page for Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week and download all sorts of templates and example materials and read old press releases to learn how you want to phrase your press release, et cetera. And I added the uh, sort of wheel reinventors need not apply. You don't need to make your own Firewood Awareness Month toolkit. We already have one. Um, it saves you so much time. It makes you part of the big national effort. And one of the things that's really important with um, firewood and forest pest awareness is that the some of the biggest issues come from interstate movement. So there's a huge uh, logical reasoning behind having your state information and your state outreach materials be in sync with adjacent and even across the country outreach materials and outreach messages because that is the target audience. It's people that are driving across the country or people that are driving between multiple states or across a big state, or traveling for any reason. Um, and so we really try to say, like, you don't, have to, you don't have to do your own thing if you don't want to. We have excellent resources available to you so that you can save time and be part of this bigger, more consistent process. Um, and then I included this really cool graphic that National Moth Week um, puts out. I am fascinated by the amount of energy and enthusiasm behind National Moth Week. And in past years, I've linked it to gypsy moth awareness, learning the number of red spots and blue spots on the gypsy moth larvae. People love it. Um, and you know, that's another way to have people looking for a forest pest that can be moving around firewood. So why not do it? Uh, there we go. Now, we also produce all sorts of custom outreach digital versions upon request. On the right, you see our 2017 newly revamped catchy modern outreach materials in our um, billboard and poster formations. We do both a light version and a dark version. Um, the light version prints better on a uh, office printer because it takes less toner. The dark version is more catchy, especially at a campground. So that's why we do two different versions for people. 
Also, uh, Asian longhorn beetle on a dark night sky doesn't really show up. So if you want to include an Asian longhorn beetle in your graphic, we suggest you use your, the light sky version. Most commonly, when people want to use our materials, they ask us for the things that I've listed on those top five bullet points. Um, they ask us to customize a poster or a brochure. Sometimes they ask us for a billboard. Billboards are often also used for like a, uh, like a table banner because it's the same uh, height width ratio. And then also postcards for sending postcards out to folks where you have a mailing address. So for instance, somebody who made a camping reservation, you might send them a postcard. And then another thing that we ask a lot for is logos for smaller items. Um, so for instance, if you're making a keychain or a uh, pen for a trade show, we'll provide you with our logos. Um, you know, we customize these materials as part of a free service. Uh, we also develop appropriate wording for your state or your region. Um, sometimes you have a special custom website that is particularly appropriate. So for instance, in California, they have firewood.ca.gov, which is an excellent resource. So all of our firewood-based resources that we create for California, we include that URL because it's good local information. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. If everybody could just make sure that they are muted, I'm going to try and meet you all again. I just, just want to be sure. Okay. And then we also change the backdrops as needed. That makes sure that the look and feel of our uh, final products resonates with the area. Great example of this is that a woman um, just this week in New Mexico asked me if we could create something that's identical to our current poster, except instead of green mountains that look sort of eastern or maybe northwestern, she wants some like New Mexico kind of mesas and buttes and canyons. And I was like, that's a great idea. You know, it'll still look really good on our poster. It'll really resonate with New Mexico visitors and residents. Let's do it. Um, there's no reason not to change something like that when we keep the rest of it consistent, but then it's more effective in the state where it's going to be used. So we're going to be doing that for New Mexico. Um, a couple of past projects that I thought might be good to see. Uh, these are some of our older designs, but I wanted to show you how they looked. Um, on the left is an advertisement that we've run in lots of different printed materials. This particular version of it was for the USA Today National Parks Annual Edition. So we customized it um, to say protect America's national parks. Um, and also it didn't mention heat treated firewood because heat treated firewood is not consistently available throughout the entire United States. It's not productive to suggest a product that only half the country can get a hold of if the ad applies to the whole country. So we changed it. That center poster um, with the big flame in the center is for uh, the Californians and they have the very big California Firewood Task Force logo array across the bottom that they wanted to display. Um, and then some very consistent wording across the top that's uh, mostly the same wording that we use for all of our national materials. So it was a little bit customized, but it made it so that it worked really well in California. And then I just realized that you've already seen this beautiful picture just outside Yellowstone of our billboard. Um, but I'm very proud of it, so it bears watching twice. Uh, <laughs> okay, so some of the ongoing work that we are doing with our partners is that we are always trying to create more consistent messaging on reserveamerica.com and recreation.gov. That's where the majority, if not vast majority, of people go to reserve a campsite either with a state or a federal agency. All the major federal land holding campground owning agencies that I know of certainly have their reservations through that system and quite a few state, uh, state parks and, and state agencies also have them on there. So we've been working to make sure that the know before you go section has consistent or nearly consistent wording regarding firewood movement for all of the thousands and thousands of reservable campgrounds in that system. And that's an ongoing project. We, um, we have very high compliance rates with that at this point. Um, the last few are you know, being picked off as we find them, um, but we're covering you know, more than 3,000 National Forest campgrounds, um, all of the US Army Corps of Engineers campgrounds, 
the vast majority of national parks campgrounds with a few exceptions for those that are managed by concessionaires. So this is a process that's going, going on for years and we're keeping, keeping up the good work. Um, we also are trying to get better information to, on the national forest system in terms of the national forest websites, which are obviously separate from the recreation.gov campground reservation websites. So we're trying to make those parallel so that the information is accessible in both locations. And then also some of the on the National Park Service, so the NPS.gov websites are going to be increasingly more consistent with this material, hopefully as time goes on, and then also on the ground. So obviously national parks, almost every national park has at least one um, staff entrance. And so we're hoping to get into things like the national park um, newspapers that you receive when you enter a national park or the brochures. We also advise on past and proposed actions, such as the changes in regulations that have been rolling into Great Smoky Mountain National Park over the last two years, which has been a very successful project that we helped with. Um, another example from this year is that in 2017, um, both Utah and Montana have been having state regulations discussions to sort of scope whether or not a regulation might be appropriate in that state. And we've been helping out with some of that scoping work to determine feasibility, um, level of protection, whether or not this is something that's desirable at all. And that kind of scoping is really workable with our program because we have access to vast amounts of information about what other states are doing, whether or not those actions have been successful, or whether or not they, if they had it to, quote, do it again, they would do it differently. Then also, um, we advised in the past on the U.S. Forest Service Firewood Task Force. Um, I have not worked on that in the last year or two. I'm not sure if that's because um, they no longer require me to participate or if that's because they no longer exist. Um, regardless, that was a project that we used to advise on that I thought would be applicable to, to some of the folks in this audience. And then last but not least, um, Firewood Scout. The URL for that is firewoodscout.org. And we helped facilitate the swap over from being a website that was only applicable in the state of Michigan to being a website that now is a membership-based pay-to-play model for states that want to list all of their firewood vendors um, so that they have a place to send the public with local firewood um, on an interactive searchable map. So um, that's a resource that some states, I think it's eight states now, are taking advantage of. And um, I highly recommend that if, you, if that seems like something that your state might be interested in, that you go to firewoodscout.org um, after this presentation is complete and take a look at it. Uh, this is an example of a campsite reservation email that I received after making a um, reservation last year to stay at Devil's Garden in Arches National Park. And you'll see I have, uh, um, oh, Rich asks which eight states. If you go to firewoodscout.org, um, it'll show you from memory, if I, I'll get it wrong, but it's probably Maine, New Hampshire, Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, California, and I don't remember which other ones. So go look when you're ready, um, but that's most of them. Okay, so some federal agencies have imposed quarantines on transporting firewood. So this is some generic wording that the National Park Service puts now on nearly every single um, reservation for a campground that they send out via email. So we had a great time at Devil's Garden. We didn't bring any firewood from my home state of Montana. Um, firewood was available for sale at all the entry communities to Arches. Uh, and I was really pleased to see that this was on our reservation list. So, um, oh, thank you, Sarah. If everybody, if anybody wants to see which states are on Firewood Scout right now, I did it fairly good job of remembering them. I missed a couple with Wisconsin, but you can, um, Sarah just posted it on the group chat. Uh, and again, if you can't find the group chat, you go up to the uh, menu bar, you pick the button that says more, and then that brings you to the chat. Okay, so uh, one of the questions you guys asked was, what are other states doing to grab people's attention? And that is like a million dollar question. It's hugely variable according to pest threat, um, state culture, so some states have a culture of, you know, passing laws and regulations and um, using that as a tool, other states do not, and it's very important to respect that state culture. Um, some states have a pure outreach-based 
uh, model and others have a regulatory model kind of in that cultural uh, bend. Um, and some of them, you know, have a long and illustrious history of attacking forest pest issues early and often. A great example of that is Illinois. You know, they, they tackled Asian longhorn beetle and eradicated it. Now they're tackling emerald ash borer, which is not eradicatable. So what are they doing? You know, so they have a very different history than, say, Nevada, um, who has never seen Asian longhorn beetle infestation, has yet to see emerald ash borer infestation does not have a heavy tree resource except for in its urban environments and probably some of its um, river systems. And that's it. So they're going to have a really different approach to outreach when you compare them. A couple of places that you might want to start if you want to sort of dive into what exactly are other states doing is subscribing to our newsletter because we highlight different state activities every month. Read the blog and especially search the blog using just our, our regular search function for guest blogs because that's State agency success stories are filed under guest blog. Uh, look through our resource library. The states are um, listed on the title of each resource. So for instance, if it's a poster that we made for Kentucky, it's going to say something like, buy it where you burn it, poster, comma, Kentucky. And you'll be able to see what their wording is that they preferred, what partners they had, because that'll be very evident from the logos. Um, and, you know, if they're doing a poster or a billboard or a brochure, then you know what outreach vector they're using. And then also we highly recommend you go to our map. Um, your neighboring states are probably going to have relatively similar um, pest situations as well as political situations. And so you'll learn a lot from um, visiting the neighboring states and seeing what they're doing. Uh, somebody asked, do you have permission to reuse the materials? That is the whole point. So I was so excited to see that somebody just outed with it. Can you do it? Yes, please. Yes, use all of our materials. That's what we're here for. Uh, if you find something on the resource library that you like, uh, but it's not quite right, so you know it doesn't have the right URL on it for your state agency, uh, or it uh, you recently entered into the gypsy moth regulated area, and so you want to have an inclusion of gypsy moth in terms of one of the pests of concern you know, something like that, um, ask us and we will change it and send you a fresh version in a high resolution PDF. Um, depending on the time of year, that takes between a few days and two months. Uh, sometimes we get really backed up with these requests, but typically they're fast. Um, and if you have good abilities to do your own modifications, so you, if you have a staff person within your agency who's a whiz at Adobe, um, InDesign or whatever, Sometimes we can just send you the raw file um, and trust that you will do them justice to put a couple logos on and swap the wording and call it a day. And that's something that we do on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the situation. But really, just always ask. Sometimes we have exactly what you want. Sometimes we can make it overnight. Um, sometimes it takes a lot longer, but we always want to try to help because that's the whole point of the campaign. All right, so another question everybody asked ahead of time, and these questions I forgot to clarify, we're sent to Sarah Goodwin from the, um, the Western Foresters Group ahead of this webinar. So I wanted to make sure that these the questions that I thought were most important were answered just forthright. So here we go. Another question is, what are the other state policies and enforcement ideas? That's such a huge question that it's really not something that we can cover on this webinar explicitly. One thing I've learned through the years is that enforcement is incredibly variable. Some states use a fairly strict enforcement um, you know, with, with um, fines and having any law officer being able to confiscate firewood, et cetera. Other states use a very hands-off um, method of basically using peer enforcement. So they only get reports from say one firewood dealer becomes aware that another one is not um, in compliance with a, a regulatory need. And so then they'll you know, be contacted by that first vendor. And so that's a sort of peer-to-peer -peer enforcement model um, other states use a public enforcement model. For instance, um, the state of Maine does checkpoints during certain big um, common travel weekends, and then they do newspaper articles about how they're going to have firewood checkpoints at the entrance to Maine. And so that uh, sort of using the media in order to create an enforceable moment and educational moment to help them enforce in a very limited way. So there's lots of models. I highly recommend that you go to our map. Um, the other nice thing about the map is that 
for the vast majority of the states, if not all of them, the policies of firewood regulation, rule, or recommendation are explicitly listed in the links at the bottom of each map summary page. And so if you want, if you want to find it, it should be there. Um, the, you know, because we're a nonprofit, we really don't want to get into the liability of talking about what commercial movement of firewood needs to do. We're really more looking at um, public movement of firewood. Uh, but sometimes the regulations apply equally to both, so you might be able to access both pieces of information right off of our summary. It depends state to state and situation to situation. All right, so somebody who's uh, clearly a communications specialist asked, what are your target audiences um, that you've identified and what tools have been created to address each? Well, at its core, our audience is people that use firewood. I have no interest in telling people that don't move, don't use firewood, but they shouldn't move firewood because why do they care? So I'm only trying to reach 50% of the people in the United States, which is information that we've um, gotten through polling, that that's about how many people use firewood. And there's two types of people, essentially, when, when you get at the biggest, broadest look, that use firewood. People that use it for their home or their cabin to heat the space, or people that use it for some sort of recreational use, like camping or travel of some sort, RVs, et cetera. Then for Firewood Month, which we launched last year, um, we parsed out those two groups and really tried to target in on some of the needs of each user group. For instance, it's extremely impractical for somebody who uses firewood for the vast majority of their home heating to buy packaged heat-treated firewood. It's a fortune. The, just the logistics of it are ridiculous. You'd have all these packages and, and where, you know, you'd have to like buy them at the store, but then how would you get them back to your house? It's crazy. So we wouldn't ever suggest that you should buy packaged heat-treated firewood for somebody who is heating their home consistently through the winter with it. Um, that sort of targeted messaging so that the user and the consumer actually gets information that's practical for them is something that we're always striving to do. So we look at our, our biggest view being those two types of users and then we kind of narrow down from there. You know, what is the need of the home heating user? Are they in an area where, um, you know, recommending that they use firewood from within 10 miles is practical or is that not practical? Or do you need to, you know, use a 50 miles? Or do you need to suggest to them that they make sure they don't cross over the county boundary because they're right at the edge of the Emerald Ash Borer quarantine area? It's all very variable according to where you are and what the pest and regulatory situation is. So we target down to that level upon request for any type of outreach that we're doing. And when we do national outreach, we generally just divide by the two, home and camping. One thing that I wanted to make sure I remembered to say, especially practical for a Western audience, um, is that we've done quite a bit of polling and we finally, I feel, settled the question of what slogan do people like the best? And um, it's interesting because when you ask professionals in the field of tree and forest pest issues what slogan they like the best, a lot of them will say they like don't move firewood the best. But when you ask the public all across the United States, States in a formal polling situation, which one they like the best, they actually like buy it where you burn it better. Um, it's, it's positive. It doesn't include the word don't. Um, it's directive. So it means it, it tells them what to do. What do I do? I buy it where I burn it. Um, but it doesn't cover every single situation. There's lots of places in the United States where buying firewood is very impractical. Um, for instance, much of Montana is really impractical and you'd be much better off telling people to gather on site when that's permitted. So when it is applicable um, and desirable for you, we recommend you use buy it where you burn it for any target audience um, where you think it works. If it doesn't work, so if you're in a place where buying firewood is just crazy, like it just doesn't make any sense, um, and gathering or harvesting is really kind of what people do, then you want to change that message and you want to use a message more like, you know, harvest from within the same county as where you plan to store your firewood or whatever makes sense for you. So just wanted to make sure that was covered. Uh, Rich asks about sudden oak death. That's a whole other topic. Let me make sure I get to that at the question and answer section. 
but we're not going to cover it right this minute because it'll kind of get me off track, just so you know. But I wrote it down. I'll get to it at the end. Okay. Um, I was also asked, is there any funding potentially available for billboards at key entrances to states? Um, we can't fund that sort of thing. Uh, we don't honestly have the money for it. Um, you as a partnering agency or industry member would be incumbent it would be incumbent on you to pay for those sorts of things. Um, every once in a while, we can assist in like, you know, proofreading a grant or providing some text for that. Uh, if that's, and we do that whenever anybody asks us to. Um, and we were successful once in getting some billboards donated um, as part of a project in um, Tennessee. So we helped get them donated and then that was coordinated. So it was at no cost to anybody. Um, but we can't pay for those things out of pocket. We simply don't have the funding. Um, I highly recommend that any state or local agency that's interested in this sort of outreach consider applying for a Farm Bill 10007 cooperative agreement. Um, it's a complicated application process, but they do fund a great deal of forest pest outreach projects, and um, I've seen it be a very successful process for a lot of people. So if you're not aware of that one, if it's not on your radar, Email me when we're done and I'll talk to you about how it works because um, maybe that'll be the way that you can get a few billboards up. But another answer more directly to the billboard question is that billboards themselves are actually less effective than a lot of other outreach options because they can't, with a few exceptions, they can't be targeted. So for instance, a postcard to all the out-of-state hunters that are coming to your state for um, big game season you know, maybe they're coming from the Midwest and they, they're sick of killing white-tailed deer and they're really excited about your gigantic antlered elk. Um, those folks are likely to be in the targeted demographic that moves firewood from the Emerald Ash Borer federally quarantined area into your western state for their big lifetime hunting trip. You would be much better off sending them a postcard than putting up a billboard and hope they're paying attention as they drive by. Um, that's just one of many, many examples of sort of firewood outreach techniques that might be more successful than broadcast messaging like a billboard. Then again, there's situations in which a billboard works really well. Um, Great Smoky Mountain National Park has essentially a ring of billboards that are each located at the areas where the worst traffic occurs, so people get stuck there for hours on end trying to get into the park. So they put up billboards because you can't escape it. Uh, here in Montana, you're driving at 80 miles an hour. Might not be really as practical as it was in uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So you're just driving too fast, might not see it. All right. Uh, this is me, by the way. I wanted to let you know I am a real person. Um, and you asked, you would be willing, would you be willing to do a state or regionally specific webinar? Absolutely. I certainly can't do 50 of them in a year, but I could do a whole bunch. And in the past, I've created custom training materials for various states. And we've done other sort of services, professional education services, on an ad needed basis. As long as it's uh, related to firewood and forest pests and we have the time, then we'll try to work it into the work plan. Um, in this picture, you can see me extremely excited about the Montana Watercraft Inspection Station signage that was put up by the interagency cooperative group that I worked with so that while the um, raft and boat and canoe owners are getting their vehicles and watercraft inspected for zebra and quagga mussel, um, they are standing next to this sign. They're literally standing there so that they're not in the way of the um, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks inspectors. And so they have this opportunity to look at this to make the connection between the movement of invasive species on their boat and the movement of invasive species in firewood and maybe just learn more. It's, it's a passive education system, but it's so much better than nothing and they have to get out of their vehicle anyway. So that's a great example of a um, regionally specific tool that we've used um, here in Montana. Uh, and, you know, that sort of state or regional specific material is exactly what we're trying to do all across the United States to the greatest of our ability. This year we also did an online training for the watercraft inspectors that is a uh, kind of kind of cool. All right well we got to the questions section. Um, 
And you might notice that several people on the slide are wearing insect costumes, including me on the far left. Uh, that is me in the Montana State Capitol at the Invasive Species Education Day for Legislators uh, with the State Plant and Health Director of Montana, the gentleman to my left, or to my right, I guess, um, Gary Adams. Um, we loan out these costumes all across North America. Um, anybody who requests them for an educational event that uh, is not for profit and will reach at least 100 people can request a costume at no cost. The only cost associated with it um, is, well, number one, your dignity takes a hit, uh, but also um, there's a shipping fee associated with it. So I typically, or the prior user, ship it to you for free because it's on their dime, and then you ship it to the next person and you pay for that. So that ranges between uh, 40 and $90, depending on how fast and which costume and all that stuff. Um, now, I had my question that I said I was going to table until the end. Um, Rich Wilkins from Oregon asked me about sudden oak death. Um, you know, we cover any kind of tree disease that can be reasonably transported on firewood. Sudden oak death has such a unique biology where it's in soil and then it ha the soil itself has to come in contact with a leaf, as I understand it, that the movement of firewood with sudden, uh, sorry, the movement of sudden oak death as a pathogen on firewood is a relatively low chance event. That said, there's plenty of tree diseases that do move on firewood as a perfectly good and high chance um, vector. And so we do definitely talk about diseases. A good example would be thousand cankers disease of walnut, which is vectored by a very, very small beetle, but it's a fungal disease that gets into the wood. Eventually the cankers coalesce and then they, um, they uh, girdle the tree functionally um, and that kills it. So, you know, we talk about these diseases plenty um, we're not by any means restricted to just things with six legs that crawl on trees. We also go with funguses. Uh, I'm sure if there was an infectious nematode, we would cover it. So we've got a pretty wide range. I don't know of any tree killing nematodes though. Um, if you have, a, so this is my last slide. If you have any questions, you can either not fight with your computer and just put them into the chat. Make sure it's sent to everyone so I, everybody can see it. Um, or I'll turn Alternatively, I can take you off mute, or I believe you can each independently take yourselves off mute. Um, so please go ahead and let's do some question and answer. I'll unmute everybody and see how that works. If it's chaos, we'll just mute back up. Okay, everyone should be unmuted, so ask away. Do you have a slide with your, this is Carrie in Washington State, do you have a slide with your contact information available? I should have made the question <laughs> slide have that. That would have been so smart. But look, my email's right here if you just want to write it down. Right, thank you. you. see it? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I am a little bit lackluster at returning voicemail, so it's even better that my phone number isn't on there. <laughs> Uh, let's see, does anybody else have questions? I see that we actually got a really wide range of um, locations that folks are coming from. We got Washington, South Dakota, California, Oregon, um, lots of Western states, so that's great. I'm sure there's lots of other ones too that I'm, I just don't know um, exactly who you are. Um, so I hope I covered a, a variety of different you know, topics and concerns for all your different areas. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? If you're asking a question, you're on mute. All right, well, I'll put Sarah on the spot then. Um, Sarah, are you there? Sarah is probably on mute. 
I was going to ask her if there's anything she thought that we should cover. Um, I'm here. The end here. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, you're there. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. I can hear so you. it was saying I was unmuted on my computer, but my phone was showing that I was muted. One thing, Lee, that oh, I have is that it might be interesting okay. for us to look at how we can help to fill in some stories on the blog regarding, you'd mentioned some of the guest blogs in the Western states. That seems like a good opportunity and something that I might be able to help facilitate. And if you're looking for a particular state or could be dual, serve dual benefits if we want to highlight one of our Western states and the good work they're doing, we could feature that on the Don't Move Firewood blog. That would be excellent. So one of the things that the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative um, sort of group has pinpointed as a, a need is examples of success stories that are short and readable. So nobody wants, well, I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyway. Nobody wants to read your annual, annual report. You know, it's too much to digest. But a one-page summary with some pictures really gets your ideas, your, you know, the ideas flowing in your head about like, oh, this is what they're doing in, you know, Colorado right now. Maybe I could apply that to Oregon. And you can bring that sort of short, easy, digestible material to, you know, your supervisor or your colleagues in a different agency down the hall or whatever. So those blogs are highly desirable. I've found that the vast majority of people, when I finally find somebody who um, I can sort of grab and say, like, will you make one of these for me? Will you write it? They're like, oh, of course. Um, so generally, we try to publish at least once a month. Um, you know, this month is Utah, last month was Hawaii. Um, so if anybody ever wants to volunteer, that's great. But Sarah, that, I think that would be awesome if you could maybe pinpoint some states that would be interested in doing it in the future. Because um, yes, we need, we need them and we need them regularly, which is kind of a trick. Great, I will add one more thing, Lee. I did notice on the, for the states that are on the line, the Western states, if you click on your individual state within the Firewood map, they list web resources specific to your state. So I'd encourage you, and I'm sure Lee would as well, if you have resources and links that you want featured, that's a good place to do so. And you, they make it very easy that you can submit those state specific links to be featured right there on their website. Yes. And every year we update all of those um, summaries and then send the summary page after it's been updated to the state plant health director and the state plant regulatory official for the state to proofread it to make sure that we haven't missed something egregious for their state essentially. Um, and then we make we make changes through the year if an event happens like a, a regulation is passed or a pest is found. Um, but oftentimes those, they only get updated once a year unless something else comes up. So I highly recommend if you want me to um, put a link on there, tell me, because otherwise it won't happen for a whole year, and even then it'll only happen if I find that link. Um, the only person who's modifying those summaries right now is me, so you're looking at it, sort of. Um, so send it on over to me and I'll fix it up for you. And if you want to use the submit a link ribbon at the bottom of the page, it automatically sends me an email instantly. Um, so it's the same as emailing me directly. It doesn't matter to me what you do. Um, let's see. So Leslie Johnson in North Dakota says they've been doing Emerald Ashboro Awareness Week events. Um, they need more outreach and camping sites. Is there a more effective next step? Uh, you know, camping is great because it, as long as it's not dispersed camping, such as like a BLM uh, model of sort of camp wherever you want, um, campers generally make a reservation or they're at least in a designated finite area. So you can reach out to them through the reservation process. So for instance, if North Dakota State Park has websites and reservation email, you could get it on their um, State Parks website. And then you could work with the reservation, you know, third party vendor who sends out the automatic emails to make sure all of those emails include information. Then you can 
you know, make sure that the front office staff is aware those emails are going out so that when they get a question about it, they answer the question sort of competently and accurately, um, which sometimes is a gap because it might be a seasonal person who doesn't know about the firewood regulations. And that's not their fault. You just want to make sure that when they do get that phone call, they know exactly what's going on. Um, so that sort of multi-step um, campground-based outreach is something that we work on a lot. And um, you kind of got to think about the user experience, right? Like, I'm just driving to North Dakota from Montana. I don't know the rules. Let me look at my email. Well, if it's in the email, you'll probably see it. And Leslie, if you want any other information or resources, um, send me an email and I'd be happy to provide you with more. We do have, you're welcome. Um, we do have a whole page on Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week outreach materials um, that has a ton of stuff on it. It doesn't actually have uh, campground specifically things. It's more state-based materials. Uh, okay, so Ryan, who actually just emailed me last week through the submit a link feature on my website, thank you, Ryan, says that the firewood they're most concerned about in Colorado is trees removed from urban community settings and then relocated to other home sites. Oh, that is just so hard um, because it seems so practical and so tempting, and it's such a common cultural phenomenon for a tree company to bulk up logs into manageable sizes and leave them in the street for people to grab free firewood. I see it in my own personal neighborhood um, where they're cutting down ponderosa pines, because I live in western Montana, and spreading mountain pine beetles um, all around our neighborhoods that way. Uh, you know, we have a tree care and landscaper suite of materials. It's just three different things, but it includes door hangers which I think might be the type of thing that would work um, in this setting where it's literally on their house. Um, it's an urban setting, so you're talking about neighborhoods. And if you're having high emerald ash borer fatality, tree fatality rates in a neighborhood, you know, having your urban crew put door hangers out saying, look, this firewood needs to be used right here in this community, otherwise you will make this problem worse. That could be helpful, um, but gosh, that one is just one of the toughest things that I can even imagine um, because it's not, like I said with the campgrounds, like Leslie was saying, you know, they're going to one place with a, a sort of a reservation and a, it's an event, um, so it's very defined, whereas the setting you're talking about, Ryan, is not one place, is not one event, and is not well defined at all. Another thing that might work would be press releases. Um, or in your area, if it's mostly professional tree services that are doing this behavior, um, some sort of continuing education credit for a training because arborists always need the EU to make sure their license is maintained. Um, and having that continuing education actually be, you know, proper firewood sanitation in an urban environment. Um, those would be the types of things that I would think might work. It gets back to that other question that we had earlier, like how do you target the users? Firewood is such an enormous topic. There isn't one kind of firewood creation type and there isn't one type of firewood user. So you really have to think it through in terms of the user experience. You're welcome, Ryan. Thanks for asking an excellent question. We also have um, mailing examples of uh, uh, one third page slips so like the, when you try fold a piece of paper to put it into a business envelope, and um, they're one third of a page, so they're super lightweight, and um, you can have your local utility include them in bills. So they essentially are free mailing, because um, your utility sticks them into the utility bills. And that's something that we um, explored for Asian longhorn beetle infestation areas to make whole neighborhoods aware simultaneously. It's using the water company or the power company to sort of piggyback a mailing so that they're already paying for um, the postage and they already have the mailing list and they already get mail out once a month anyway so it doesn't matter to them um, and then it reaches everybody in the region. So I've only got two minutes left until I uh, am done with this 
So if anybody else has a question, um, please either put it in the chat or speak up now. I don't hear anyone, so if you're talking, you're on mute. Um, so Sarah, should we call it done? That sounds good. And for the Western States on the line, I will be sending, once we have the recorded webinar ready to go, I will be following up with that for the group if there are others in your states that you wish to, wish to share this with. Yep, and I will also um, be sending out the final recording with my May Firewood Outreach Professionals newsletter. Um, so it'll be available there. So definitely sign up for that newsletter um, so that you get an extra reminder about the recording. Great, and thank you, Lee, for your time and expertise. We certainly appreciate you doing this webinar for us. Yeah, you're welcome. Everybody have a great weekend, and that's a wrap.